All right. Well, I have 10 o'clock and per usual, we'll probably wait a minute or two and let a couple last minute people hop on. That way we can get them out of the waiting room. So probably about 10.02, um, we can start up. Okay, well, I have 10 or two on my clock. Um, we can go ahead and get started. That way, if anybody else wants to join in, I'll just have the other agents admit them through the waiting room. Um, good morning and uh, welcome to the third Cattle Conversation series. Um, we've already had two already. Um, our first one was with Dr. Hanselcheck and he kind of went over some understanding preg loss uh, with us a couple weeks ago and then last week we had Dr. Dale Blasey on and he discussed with us a awesome presentation on post calving nutrition um, and then today we are here with Dr. AJ Tarpoff and he's going to go a little bit through um, calf health from birth to branding and probably a little bit more and then next week uh, we hope you'll join us with one of our own Clint, Clinton Laughlin. Um, he's going to go over some semen and sire selection and uh, if you guys are just joining us for the first time, we do have those previous programs recorded. Um, you can find those either through each one of your respected agents or on either of our YouTubes, or if you just go ahead and give us an email directly, um, we all have those saved and recorded so we can send them directly to you. Um, uh -oh. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of introductions. Um, this isn't just me doing all this work. There's a little bit of workforce behind these programs. Um, Lish Bohr, she's the Ag Agriculture Extension Agent for the Cottonwood District. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Clint Laughlin, um, he's the Livestock Agent for the Midway District. Brett Milton, he's the Livestock Agent for the River Valley District. And then we have Sandra Wick. Um, she's a crop production agent, but right now she's kind of doing double duty. She's also the Livestock Agent for the post Ross. Post Rock District. And then myself, um, Justine Henderson, I'm the livestock agent for the Central Kansas District. So um, earlier this morning, you should have received a PowerPoint for today's presentation. Um, if you didn't, you can email any one of us and we'll get that sent over to you just in case you'd like to follow along throughout the presentation. Um, and then next, I will introduce you to, oh, I'm going to go over this. Sorry. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and just send them into the chat box. Um, somebody will be keeping an eye on that and then we will take care of all of those at the end. And then now I will introduce you to our speaker of the day, um, Dr. AJ Tarpoff. Um, he's worked and served the beef industry from every aspect of production from pasture to plate. Uh, he attended Kansas State University earning his Bachelor of Science from the Animal Science and Industry Department. Um, he then followed with his DVM and his master's degree from the College of Veterinary Medicine. Following graduation in 2012, he practiced feedlot production medicine in Alberta, Canada. And then in 2016, he returned to the Department of Animal Sciences and Industry at K-State to serve in a, as an assistant professor at the beef extension, as a beef extension veterinarian. 
Um, AJ has a 70% extension, 20% research, and 10% teaching appointment. And he also works closely with producers, practicing veterinarians, and members of the industry to bring relevant extension and education that improves cattle health and productivity of the beef industry. So um, thank you so much, AJ, for being here with us today. I know you had class earlier this morning, um, and we're very thankful that you're on today to talk about some calf health with us. And I'll um, turn that over to you so you can share your screen. Okay. Well, thank you, Justine. How uh, is that coming through? Looks pretty good. All right. Going to move some things around here so I know what I'm doing. And uh, we'll go ahead and get uh, get started. So uh, today I'm going to cover a lot of different a uh, aspects of calf health. And I think it's important now. I think this will be, you know, review for a lot of you. But it's good to start thinking about these things uh, now uh, before some of these issues occur. Uh, but also kind of be prepared on what's coming up for our upcoming uh, changes in the season and changes in immune function of these animals. Uh, so what's our ultimate goal? Okay, our calf health, regardless of what the outcome of that calf is on uh, whether it's going to be a replacement, whether it's going to be a breeding bull or, or it's going to be a grower calf that is uh, ultimately going to uh, end up in the food production chain is we're trying to get this baby calf that just hit the ground uh, that has, uh, you know, been grazed out on pasture for the uh, next several months of life through the summer months and ultimately be weaned and become a pr productive member of the feedlot society, so to speak. Uh, so I think with that, I, I want to throw up a quick qu uh, question, a poll question from uh, the attendants on uh, on immune function. Uh, so I, I, uh, here we go. So uh, how how early in life do calves fully res uh, respond to a vaccine? OK, and, and I have this at, at fully respond. Um, and it's kind of a good place to start because I'll uh, kind of outline the immune function of a calf, uh, both early in life. Um, you know, early in life and, and kind of what to expect from the products that we use, uh, but it's good to have these realistic expectations. And yes, uh, somebody will let me know whenever that's all done. I think we'll give him just a few more seconds. All right, go ahead and close that poll. Yeah, okay. Oh, good. So we got a week, we got a month of age. Um, no, that's 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 very good. And I, and I appreciate that that's where everybody's kind of at. Um, they, this is kind of a busy graph, but this completely outlines the entire, entire immune function of a, uh, of a young calf uh, from conception all the way through puberty. Okay, so at birth, Keep in mind that these animals, uh, they have no, you know, they have a fully functional immune system, but their entire active immune system comes from mom through passive immunity from the colostrum, which we'll talk about. Um, now that, that starts to decline. Those antibodies they get from mom, mom don't last, uh, you know, extended periods of time, uh, but they will function as the active immune system for the first couple months of life. Now, once that starts to decline, we do have an uptake of, of the calf's actual immune system responding to challenges. And this is kind of our area of window of susceptibility where they can, uh, where they can you know, sometimes see disease, but also that's an opportune time for us to challenge the immune system appropriately with vac different types of vaccines to help boost our immunity against some key pathogens. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about, okay? So again, completely naive, they need colostrum, colostrum is king. Uh, we start to see some of that takeover, uh, but that calf starts to have a pretty good immune function by five to eight months of age, okay? Um, now those maternal antibodies really start to decline around branding time, okay? Historical branding. Uh, but we're really talking about two to four months of age just prior to turnout where we uh, traditionally work our calves for the first time before turnout to uh, summer pasture, okay? Uh, that's, that's kind of our critical period, one of our first critical control areas uh, that we can see some of these, uh, these uh, um, usage of a lot of uh, different products. So first, postpartum considerations, colostrum. Uh, colostrum is absolutely pivotal. 
And I know many of you have already been challenged with, uh, especially if you're calving right now, uh, trying to ensure that we warm these calves up, that they get adequate intake of colostrum from either mom or if we have to uh, intervene because we pulled them away from their mom uh, to make sure that they get this critical colostrum. Uh, not only for the, the well-being of that animal early in life to get up to a good start because that colostrum is packed full of fats and minerals and vitamins, everything this calf really needs, uh, but really the functional and immune system and getting that passive transfer of antibodies is so, so critical. If calves don't get the adequate amount of colostrum, uh, you know, they are six and a half times more likely to get sick as a neonate. Okay, most likely from, uh, from scours, calf scours, diarrhea, uh, even septicemic events where they get you know, it systemic infections. Um, even post that month of age where we see a lot of the neonate issues, uh, they are a little over three times more likely to get sick uh, while they're out on summer pasture, usually from things like pneumonia. And we'll talk about that as well, but uh, really it's five times more likely that they, they can die. Uh, prior to weaning, just from not having having adequate colostrum intake. Uh, that's how critically important it is. Uh, timing is everything. Uh, you know, how much colostrum do, do we generally recommend? You know, about a gallon. Okay, each calf needs about a gallon of quality colostrum uh, into that animal from mom. Uh, but the absorption time is limited. Okay, and right now we're, we're challenged because we have cold calves, so we're trying to warm up. Uh, colostrum absorption is not quite as high in shield calves. Okay, so it is critical right now that if we do have some of those chilled calves situation, we want to warm them back up to above 100 degrees Fahrenheit before we uh, tube or inter intervene with uh, colostrum. Okay, um, if you don't have uh, fresh or frozen uh, colostrum that you can either get from mom, uh, what are our options? Okay, uh, we have replacer products and supplement products that are out on the market right now. Um, and you know, replacers, they're, they're worth their weight in, you know, for what, what we pay for, okay? They are much more expensive. They're about double the, the cost of supplements, uh, but a replacer is, is meant to be just that, that they are not gonna get adequate uh, consumption from mom within that first nine or uh, nine hours or so that we are gonna fully replace what, that, what those animals needs are of colostrum uh, through those antibodies. Uh, these products generally have what's on the label of IgG over 100. Okay, 100 or greater is what we're looking at for uh, commercial uh, colostrum replacements. Uh, supplements, uh, they have their place as well. Uh, animals that have suckled, but you're concerned about how much they've had, we've had to intervene and warm them up after they've had a little bit of uh, colostrum. We may go ahead and supplement them with, uh, with some secondary amount uh, to make sure that they get an adequate amount into their system. Okay. Um, I, I do warn you fresh and frozen. I have dairy colostrum here with question marks. Um, uh, it is a biosecurity risk to bring fresh or frozen colostrum from another operation into our cow herds. Uh, we can in inadvertently introduce some disease uh, that we would not otherwise have introduced. Things like Yoni's disease or bovine leukemia virus, uh, leukosis. Um, so that's why it, it, it's kind of a last resort. That's the only option we have, uh, but it is much further down on the list. If we can get it from mom, that's great. Great. Um, if not, you know, kind of second step, go to some of our commercial products. And if not, then it, it's, it's, it's further down the list. Uh, so critically important. Since I'm on the topic of newborns, and I'm sure everybody is, uh, has been battling this, especially if they've been calving recently, is cold stress calves. And I really wanted to throw this out there that it, it, it's important. Um, my biggest recommendation is to carry a rectal thermometer in your calving kit or when you're out checking cattle, have a thermometer handy. When these calves get chilled, uh, they, they very much need, uh, need some extra support. Um, I did see that we do have a question. Oh, there we go. Um, cold stress calves, carry a thermometer because that really is indicative of how much cold stress that we have on these animals. Uh, normal temperature, normal body temperature, these newborn calves can be around 101. Uh, 101 to 102 is uh, is very typical. Um, now, once we start dropping down below 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which doesn't take very much, uh, that those are mild signs of hypothermia. These calves will start shaking, then they start getting muscle rigidity. Um, as they get dipped down into the 90s, we see some pretty severe uh, insults to the, the body. They start shunning blood. That's where we see issues with ears and tails uh, with frostbite because the body does shunt blood uh, back up into the body to help protect the, the vital organs, which would be the heart and the brain. Uh, so what are our options? Okay, we know we have a cold calf, we need to get it warmed up. Uh, you know, what do we have available? 
you know, the old tried and true, you know, drying the cattle off, uh, using a hairdryer. I've seen a lot of that on social media and everything else. It, it, it's all very functional. Okay. Um, but the old tried and true, the floorboard heater of the pickup, the defrost, okay, that, that can work great. Uh, we can put them on the floorboard. One way to increase the efficacy is uh, to take a cardboard box and actually put that cardboard box over the top of them. So they kind of have a circulating air tunnel uh, on, on that passenger side of your pickup. Uh, heating lamps and blankets, again, work great. If you do use lamps, be, uh, be cautious of uh, fire. Uh, there are some newer ones that have some really nice protective uh, outer coatings to make sure that we, uh, we don't have the fire hazard, especially if you have them in a barn with a lot of hay around. Uh, we, we do need to be cognizant of that because once they get warmed up, these calves uh, will stand up and start being a little bit more rambunctious. Um, warm water immersion. I do like to cover that. Uh, you know, this is, the, you know, taking them into the bathtub, okay, uh, can work very well. They actually did a study that warm water immersion is one of the quickest way that, uh, ways that we can uh, return calves that are severely hypothermic back up to body temperature. However, we do have to be careful and do it appropriately if we're gonna use warm water immersion. Uh, we can't put them directly into hot water. If we do that, there's a chance that we can actually give cold shock to these calves, uh, where the cold blood that's in the extremities, the legs, the outside of the body, the skin, uh, gets uh, quickly shunted back to the inside of the body, uh, namely the heart. And the heart can actually get cold shocked uh, where it'll stop. So it's, it's a type of heart failure uh, that we can see cold shock if we warm these calves up too quickly. So we start with lukewarm water and we consistently add warm water and replace that because the calf acts as an ice cube, you know, in a, in a glass of water. It starts to melt, uh, you know, and, and kind of uh, cools down the rest of the water around it. So we will have to consistently add, add more water. It's labor intensive to do it right, but can have very good effects. Uh, it will take a little over an hour to get that calf back up to uh, regular body temperature. Uh, so be prepared that all of these warming attempts, nothing is immediate, uh, that they do take time. We're, uh, you know, realistic, uh, you know, an hour, hour and a half uh, plus uh, to be able to get these calves warmed up appropriately. Uh, some of these newer, uh, you know, these newer boxes, the, uh, the heat boxes, uh, where they circulate warm air through them, they're great. Uh, the, we can clean them in between calves, especially if we have six scour calves that are cold later in the season. Uh, you know, we can clean them, we can disinfect them. I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, very inventive things that uh, ranchers have, have made for some of these warm up boxes. Uh, so the biggest thing is we don't want them to get uh, too much direct heat. We want circulating air and warm these animals up appropriately. So it does take time. Okay, so that's first thing in life, colostrum, making sure they're warm. Next, what are some of our key neonate uh, calf issues that we see? Scours, okay? Scours is kind of king within that first month of life or so. And I do like to point out that not all scours are the same, okay? Many times so we see uh, bacterial causes, viral causes, and actually protozoa as well. It's good to note that these bacteria, viruses, and protozoa outside of salmonella on this list, these circulate regularly within almost all of our cow herds, okay? These are normal viruses that, that circulate within very low levels. Uh, we don't see the issues. They circulate at low levels, but they are there. So it's expected that we, that's why they can uh, rear their ugly heads year in and year out is they're just kind of normally circulating, okay, within groups of animals. The other thing I like to point out is, yes, we have these different types of pathogens causing calf scours, but it's a good idea to know the time frames when we're most at risk, when our calves are most at risk of seeing some of these diseases. Uh, the E. coli, the true bacterial issues that we see are generally pretty early in life, okay, within the first uh, couple of days of life up to about a week. After that, we kind of have these three main causes of, uh, of, of neonatal diarrhea or, or calf scours, rotavirus, coronavirus, and cryptosporosis. Okay, crypto is a protozoa. These, these other two are viruses. Uh, these are what causes the vast majority of our, our scour issues um, in, in beef herbs, especially in Kansas. And we have that data from the diagnostic lab uh, from sample submissions. Uh, so the key time frame is about five days up to about three weeks of life is where we can see these and where they rear their ugly head. Uh, later in life, we can see some other things like salmonella or coccidia, usually more of a wing calf issue. Uh, but our main thing that we're concerned about is rota, corona, and crypto. 
okay, which is about uh, a week old up to about three weeks of age is where we see our, our key issues with this. Uh, not all animals are, uh, you know, not all animals within our herd are mostly at risk of these. It's usually those later born animals that we have uh, more concerned about with, uh, uh, with, with our scour issues, our last third, so to speak, to hit the ground. Uh, so get biosecurity and protecting ourselves against calf scours is critical. Uh, this is a management uh, issue that we can manage ourselves out of. Uh, every little bit helps, okay? So even if you can make small changes to your management to help decrease the risk of calf scours, it can have very, very good results. Um, the biggest thing is do the best we can to try to calve in a clean environment. I know it's not perfect. We, the, the, these are livestock, they're outside, um, but we do the best that we can. Uh, sometimes that can be the, you know, just moving where these animals rest, moving where we feed these animals to decrease the contamination over a larger area. Uh, that could be moving shelters, moving windbreaks, feeding in different locations, especially if we're, uh, we're feeding out in the pasture, we're dropping cubes, we're rolling out hay. Uh, if we can move some of those different areas to spread the contamination out as, as it, the solution to pollution is dilution. We're just diluting the same amount of, of contaminants over a larger area, so it has decreasing amount of effects on our newborn calves. Uh, older calves do spread those uh, pathogens to young ones. Uh, so the calves that are hitting the ground first, they're a little bit older. They get exposed to these pathogens at a low amount, but they act as amplifiers. They don't get sick, but they amplify these pathogens and spread them all over the environment. Uh, so it's the older calves that are really the concern to these newborn calves on why they get some of these scour issues, okay? Because the amplification of the older calves, that's what we're trying to separate and that's what we're trying to do. If we can separate calves by age, uh, by a couple weeks of age, if we calve for uh, two to three weeks and then we separate them, uh, either we move those pairs out, uh, we try to uh, move, move the, uh, the still pregnant animals to a different location to calve, uh, anything like that that we can separate calf by age uh, will absolutely help. And that truly is the basics of the Sandhills calving system, which I'll touch on briefly. Um, it, it's really minimizing, con it, it, it's increasing space, allowing calves to uh, be born into cleaner environments, and it is segregating calf, uh, calves by age. Uh, the, the whole thought process behind this system is a true management scour prevention uh, management program, okay? It's moving pregnant cows every two to three weeks to calve in a new paddock. Okay, so we start all, all our animals are in one, we calved for two to three weeks, we move anything that's still pregnant to a new location to calve for the next uh, next couple weeks. Once the uh, youngest calf is about a month, month of age, we can move everybody back together and manage them as one group. I know this is, isn't practical in every operation. Uh, we don't have unlimited fence line. We don't have an uh, unlimited calving areas. A lot of times our calving pastures are where we have easy access. Uh, so even small amounts of changes and using the principles behind this uh, can really go a long way. If we can change where we feed, if we can change, uh, you know, move our bedding areas or our protected areas with windbreaks, if we can move those during the calving season, uh, that can absolutely help. Uh, but if, if most importantly, if we can separate calves by age, if there's a way that we can do that effectively, uh, that can have some of our best potential on, on decreasing scour issues later into the calving season. Uh, so again, scraping, uh, removing manure, uh, replacing bedding, all of these things help remove some of those contaminants in the environment and can all be very helpful. If you do have scouring issues, a couple of rules of thumb to have in your back pocket, okay? Those calves, if they have, uh, if their tongue is warm, they're still nursing, they're still getting around, but they do have the dirty rear end, uh, usually we go uh, towards oral electrolytes, okay? Work with your lo local veterinarian. A lot of veterinarians carry some really high-end high uh, electrolytes on hand uh, that they, they can have ready and available for you. Um, if they're down, they're cold in the mouth, they, it's not wet, they have a dry nose, and we're in cold weather, this makes it pretty uh, critical, okay? Uh, may need IV uh, fluid therapy. These calves get dehydrated rapidly. And if they're not getting up, they're not drinking, and they're already kind of down and out, uh, this is where contacting your local veterinarian to have some, uh, some further treatment with IV fluids, getting them warm, and having that supportive therapy can really get through uh, quick. Uh, the, the quicker you make that decision, the better off this calf will, uh, th this calf will actually be. Uh, diagnostics, I get that question a lot as well. You know, should we run diagnostics on uh, scouring calves? And my rule of thumb is if you have more than one calf breaking, 
with scours in a relatively short amount of time, it is a good idea to have some diagnostics heard. Contact your local vet. They'll take some uh, some manure samples. They'll uh, take some other samples if, if need be uh, that they can get those sent to the diagnostic lab. If you have had calves that have died, they can take the samples from those, uh, uh, those deceased animals as well. But the biggest thing is uh, one, that we have to correct treatment. Okay, two is human safety. A lot of these scouring pathogens can cause zoonotic disease. That means that we can get disease from them. Okay, we can see some of those impacts on having uh, diarrhea, dehydration, things like that. And that's the last thing that we need to have happen to ourselves when we're, we need to care for these animals. Uh, so that way we can kind of up our, our own basic uh, biosecurity with gloves, making sure we wash our hands, uh, keeping our, our soil clothing separate. Um, and, and it can really help to make sure that we're not spreading it around. So uh, that's my, my basic two cents on treatment, how, how much treatment, and then when do we run diagnostics? Now, as calves age, and I want to keep, I'm, I'm going to keep moving right along because I uh, want to make sure we cover everything and don't want to take up too much of your time today. But uh, as calves begin to age, after we get over that kind of uh, critical 30 days of life, uh, the threat of disease changes a little bit in these, uh, these young calves. It changes from neonatal issues like scours to more of our bovine respiratory disease. Pneumonia is what, what our bigger concern is, especially after turnout once these animals have been out on pasture, is we, they are susceptible to BRD, B, uh, bovine respiratory disease. Now the immune function at this point in time, uh, obviously that's where some of our antibodies are starting to drop. Uh, the calf's own immune system is starting to take off, but what are some critical factors, some husbandry factors that impact the immune function of, of calves, all calves? Um, one is quality nutrition, okay? And if they're already out on green grass, the mom is, uh, she's really putting on some, uh, some body weight, should have really good, good amounts of milk, uh, things should be good. Uh, the environment does play a role. If we have some really tough weather, if we have a lot of muddy conditions, this can impact the immune system negatively. Um, you know, vaccination, we'll talk about that, but really maturity. Keep in mind that it does take time for these calves, their immune system to mature. Okay, it's not fully mature up till uh, puberty or so. Uh, so we're looking at over a year of, of age before they have a fully functional, uh, really strong immunity. Uh, things that hurt, stress, all types of stress. Preparing the calf for weaning is, is critical. And preparing a calf for weaning to make sure we're not going to have issues in the fall uh, really begins in the spring. How much colostrum they get, um, whether we've had some, uh, some branding vaccines, even some pre-weaning. Uh, so all of these things play a, a critical role in our overall success because as cow-calf operators, our biggest income uh, comes at, at the end of the season, typically for a spring calving herd, we're selling calves in the fall uh, to make sure that we, we are selling a good product and we have a, a good health background on these animals is really critical. So it's, it's preparing them for weaning. So how early can you vaccinate? Back to the initial question, we talked about the immune function, where, where they're stressed, where they have immune uh, you know, antibodies from their mom through colostrum, how their, their immune system is starting to come up. Uh, a good rule of thumb is we have a very uh, uh, reliable response by two to three months of age. So our traditional branding time is where we do have a very reliable response to most of our vaccine products. Um, now, there is some earlier work that has been, uh, that some work that's been done by uh, several of the pharmaceutical companies uh, showing some really nice responses even down to a month of age. So the question comes up is, well, doc, we're going into branding, we're working on before turnout, but we have some of these younger calves. Should we still vaccinate them? Do we still see an effect? And what has been shown uh, was, was some very recent work on immunology and, and in these uh, very young calves, month of age or so, is we are, we are seeing a reliable response. Uh, we see that reliable response later as they age when we give them a booster. Uh, but even when we challenge those animals with some of these, uh, some of these critical pathogens that we, we vaccinate against, uh, they do have some protective immunity. Okay, so uh, we are seeing that uh, young, as younger calves. Uh, real quick about stress. Okay, vaccinations are great. I'm going to talk about vaccines and their importance, and I've already mentioned some of those some of those uh, components. But we can't forget about husbandry practices. Okay, things that we do will compound stresses against these animals. Okay, so uh, minimizing stress, making sure that we aren't uh, co we, we aren't 
co-pound, you know, compounding some of these stressors on these animals is critical. Um, you know, we see it every day in, in the feedlot industry where we have freshly weaned, freshly shipped co-mingled calves and put them into the feedlot. Uh, no matter how, how many vaccines they've had, uh, the, the, those are enough stressors to have their immune system be overcome and we can still see disease. So our general guidelines for calves, okay, when, you know, back to vaccines is one, we need a functional immune system. If we're going to vaccinate, we need to make sure it's functional. Um, our biggest concern in these young calves is bovine respiratory disease. So what do we vaccinate against? Well, it, it's, it turns out a lot of the, uh, the viral pathogens that uh, are key rollers, uh, key players within the bovine respiratory disease complex. So when should we vaccinate? Typically branding time. Uh, I have three to four months of age, but really it's at two to four months of age, even down to a month of age for some of those lingering animals that are uh, later calving. Uh, but that's our critical time where we have a we, we uh, where we do have that kind of dip in immune function uh, as the body's starting to take over, and it's kind of a prime time to help target the immune system against some of these pathogens. Uh, the next period of time is pre-weaning. Okay, so uh, 45 days or so prior to uh, actual separation from mom in the fall uh, can be another uh, key time to be able to booster the immune function before some of the further stresses post weaning. Uh, I do have the question, well, you know, we traditionally we only handle them at weaning, okay, uh, which is fine. If that's where we give a booster dose, that's completely understandable. But something to keep in mind is stressed animals, do they always respond to vaccines the same as a non-stressed animal? and stress uh, plays a key role in this. Uh, if they're going through the most stressful time of their life, is it, do we always wanna challenge them uh, with a vaccine? And sometimes we have to, sometimes we can push that and move that to a pre-weaning uh, where we're not compounding some of those stressors all at the same time. So general guidelines, what do we try to protect against? Uh, back to the basics, okay, clostridial disease or black leg vaccines. If you are going to be banding, castrating, or dehorning, make sure that we don't forget about tetanus. Tetanus is critical. Not all of our seven or eight ways actually uh, contain a tetanus toxoid. Uh, so we want to make sure that that is, uh, that is included, uh, especially if we're going to be band, band castrating. Uh, Five-way modified live virals or five-way virals, these are our respiratory viral vaccines, okay? So if I mention a five-way viral, uh, those, th th that is what we're talking about, and I'll talk about what, what's included into that. And then also, once we get closer to weaning, um, some of our more, um, you know, our increasing recommendations are some of the, the respiratory uh, bacteria uh, vaccines that we have. This would be our pastorellas, as it's often referred to. Uh, so Mannheimia, pastorella, histophilus. Uh, we generally start including these uh, into some of our vaccine recommendations as that calf ages a little bit, uh, once it starts getting closer to weaning. As with some of our other management decisions, along with vaccination is uh, castration, okay? Castration or dehorning. Uh, timing is everything. If we're going to back, if we're going to uh, castrate or if we have to dehorn, uh, the earlier in life, the better. If we can catch them at birth, that is fantastic. It's the least stressful on that animal. Uh, the older the calf gets, uh, the more that these testicles, the longer these testicles are attached to the calf, the more the calf is attached to them. Okay. So it truly is that if we can get them off earlier, it's less stressful and it's a less hindrance to that animal in recovery and getting back to production. Uh, just so you know, I, you know, I, as part of my job, I want to make sure that, you know, recommendations that come out, uh, actually did a nationwide survey from cow-calf uh, veterinarians all over the U.S. and asked them what their recommendations are, okay? And from their recommendations, if they're going to uh, make a, a vaccine recommendation at branding, that's at two to, uh, two to four months of age, 88% uh, of, uh, of responding veterinarians do recommend a modified live viral vaccine. Uh, to these calves. Uh, on top of that, what do they? What kind of coverage do we get? Uh, one of, is our multivalent clostridial vaccine, which was already brought up. Uh, the next one is uh, kind of our five-way uh, five-way modified live viral. Okay, IBR, BRSV, PI3, and BVD. Okay, those are the things that are traditionally give, given and recommended to calves at that young age. Okay, this would be at that first initial process. What about castration? Okay, I mentioned castration earlier in life is better. Uh, responding veterinarians do recommend different types of, uh, of uh, castration depending on the age, okay? If they're gonna be castrating early, or, early in life, uh, you know, typically it's knife cut is recommended most often, 
okay? And that would be at that two to four, uh, two to four months of age if we're going to castrate early in life at that point in time. Uh, once we get out to weaning, this is where we see some separation and different veterinarians, uh, you know, uh, they do recommend different types of things. Uh, regardless, we do want to have it done early, but regardless, work with your veterinarian on type of method. We're actually running a study at the beef stocker unit currently on different methods and the impacts and healing of those uh, that, that can affect a lot of producers. So uh, here, here and hopefully by fall, we will have all that information available for producers around the state to make better uh, management decisions. Um, regardless of the method of castration, 97% of veterinarians do recommend uh, giving a tetanus vaccine or tetanus toxoid vaccine uh, at least at time of castration, especially when uh, banding is the method of castration. Uh, once we get to pre-weaning, some things change a little bit. Okay, one, our five-way modified live is, is, is the biggest thing that is recommended. Uh, what, what increases is actually some of our, uh, you know, some of our, um, our uh, manheimia toxoids are increased a little bit more often. On top of that, more veterinarians, 2% uh, more actually do recommend the modified live. I do have a quick question that I'll go ahead and address, I believe. Okay, so most of the calves are, they're ban uh, banded at 48 hours of life. They go through the chute around May 5th. Uh, then is, is this proper? Absolutely. So they, they can be castrated uh, early in life. They're a couple of months old at, at time of initial processing. Uh, so that, that is exactly what we're talking about. If, we're, uh, if we are using band castration early in life with the little rings, the little Cheerios, um, what my, the biggest thing to double check is making sure that we get both testicles in, inside of that band. Okay, we wanna make sure that we have both testicles underneath the band, we get that band up and over. Um, if, if both testicles have not descended, um, you know, we really need to make sure that we get both of those out. So uh, band castrating early in life uh, within tw uh, 24 or 48 hours of birth, uh, that is a trim, that, that, that's a great time to do it. it. It's very beneficial to that animal because it's gonna hinder them even less the younger they are. And then going through the shoot for the first time, uh, again, at turnout, uh, that is our traditional branding period. So that is a great time to uh, be doing those, uh, uh, doing those individual uh, management situations. So um, pre-weaning vaccines, we're talking, this is fall, okay? Pre-weaning would be fall, early fall. Uh, we're pulling them off of grass. We're going to run them through and do, maybe do some pre-weaning uh, vaccines before we pull them off of summer grass about a, a month, 45 days prior to weaning. Okay, where we're actually going to separate those calves. Um, the biggest recommendation change is that uh, getting more of the, the Bacterium products or the Pasteurellas involved. So the sorry, the question comes up is Doc, why so many doses? Shouldn't you know one dose be sufficient? You know why are we giving so many doses? And the idea behind that, that is what's called the amnestic response. Uh, when we and take a naive calf that's never had a vaccine before, and we give them one dose. Okay, we are challenging the immune system for the first time. Um, you know, they, that the immune system recognizes the challenge, but often doesn't mount a huge, uh, a huge response and a huge amount of protection. We have stimulated memory in the immune system, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, but you know, usually one dose with a lot of these different products, especially when the immune system is still developing, is not sufficient to have full protection. That's why if you read the label, a lot of them do call for a secondary vaccine uh, that really acts as a booster. And with that booster, uh, this is this is an amount of antibody that circulates within the, uh, the amount of antibody circulating within the body uh, that we see this huge amnestic response of a lot of circulating antibody protection for these animals. Okay, and that, that's where we really see some good, you know, some good protective immunity. And that's why we have multiple doses that we will administer to these calves. The other thing is realistic expectations. Not all animals within our group will respond the same way to our vaccines. Within any given population, if I have a, a hundred calves that I vaccinate, okay, uh, we have some you know, that are just immune freaks. We give them one dose and they respond so fantastically, they have great protection. Unfortunately, we do have a very small percentage as well that you know, they, they just didn't respond very well, that they don't have the protective immunity. 
Okay, and that's why that also gives us some coverage whenever we get boosters, okay? But our goal is to have the vast majority of our animals respond accordingly to have some herd protection and some lasting immunity within each of these individuals. So weaning, we got through, uh, we got through birth, we got through early stages in life, we got through the summer grazing, now we're, we're uh, getting into weaning time, okay? This is one of the most stressful times of, of the beef animal's life. Okay, is weaning, uh, social and nutritional. Okay, we're going into new environments. We're getting the social anxiety of separation from mom, uh, but we're also changing nutrition. Okay, uh, they may be eating out of a bunk. We are uh, separation from mom. Uh, most of it is the social stress. Okay, just new environments, new groups of animals. Uh, you know, may maybe change in location. These are all new. And, uh, you know, just like, it, you know, just like people, it's, you know, inherently it's stressful to have, have different types of change. Okay, so how do we help decrease the stress? There's a lot of different ways that we can do this. Planning out ahead of time is really critical for this. Um, can we handle the cattle prior to weaning? Okay, uh, just the interaction with people, uh, separation, moving them, introducing them to a new environment or a new location, introducing them to water troughs and possibly feed troughs that they will have post weaning. All of these things help with decreasing that stress. Uh, there are some soft weaning programs that are available out there through uh, direct contact fence line weaning where we do have the moms on the one side. They can still see them, they can still touch them, they can still lick on them, uh, but they obviously are, are physically separate by a fence. There are some uh, two-stage weaning programs with different types of nose flaps, and I know uh, some, some producers really enjoy, uh, really like that, some don't. Again, there, there's different ways that we can do it, but really acclimating these animals to their new environment, uh, possibly weaning them into a location and removing the cows as opposed to weaning the calves and transporting them. Some of those smaller changes can reduce the overall amount of stress load uh, from these calves. Introducing the new nutrition, if we're going to be feeding those calves after weaning, if we can start having them nibble on it with their mom by their side, uh, you know, just for a couple days leading up to weaning can go a long way. Uh, so it's all about re reducing the stress. Just to finish up, don't forget about other stressors that are happening to these animals. Uh, parasite control is critical. Work with your local veterinarian on that. Uh, internal parasites, uh, coccidiosis, especially going into weaning pens. Uh, that, that's the, the stress can overcome and we can see some issues of coccidiosis that we can, uh, we can combat this by doing, uh, using some different products. And then external parasites, uh, you know, after, after the summer grazing, flies, ticks, all these can be very stressful. So those are other things to, to also uh, uh, also control. Uh, so with that, that's my basic presentation. Again, I didn't want to take too much of your time today, but I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, so I, I, I do have a, one more question that I'll address. What's your opinion about pulling uh, right off the cow and into the sale ring? Okay, so uh, again, that that it's a it's a common practice that a lot a lot of people implement. That uh, for for uh, especially for cow calf operators that don't have facilities or the ability to handle wean calves, uh, I completely understand uh, you know why why you know why that's a necessity. Why we're selling directly off the cow. Uh, now, uh, the, in those circumstances, uh, that's where we get into is, is there you know that that's inherently a very high risk animal. OK, uh, direct weaning straight into the sale ring uh, that that, you know, that that is a more high risk animal to develop disease uh, because of that. Are there some things that we can do, such as the vaccines that we discussed, the uh, the, the branding, the pre weaning? Uh, there's a lot of uh, verified programs that actually can help, uh, you know, you it's you're protecting yourself and your calves by doing those uh, programs, uh, but it's also uh, trying to get some value added going through the sale ring that they have had those uh, those verified uh, health records behind them uh, can still go a long way. And it's all about uh, the buyer's perception of risk. Okay, so uh, that that's where, you know, you know preconditioning gets thrown out, but it's really the, the perception of risk on how much somebody is, is willing to offer for your calves. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it, it depends on who you are. I completely understand. And I, I, I Hey, weaning, abrupt weaning and selling, uh, selling the same day, there's definitely a time and place for that. Are there some things that you can do to still uh, gain more value from your calves and to protect yourself while, while they're still on the operation? Absolutely. And some of those verified programs and working with your veterinarian can really help with that. Uh, 
Um, so, I mean, ideally, if we're trying to reduce the risk, if we're going to be maintaining those animals, uh, if we're going to be feeding them uh, for any length of time uh, prior to sale, or if we're going to retain ownership on those animals for a longer period, abrupt weaning it probably isn't the best bet. Uh, that's where we will want to uh, soft wean them. We will want to wean them into a different location, feed them, uh, and be able to maximize on some of that change in nutrition and get some added pounds to those animals within 45 or 60 days. Um, so again, everybody's management is a little bit different. So I'm, I'm not gonna harp on, on any particular way, uh, but we can really maximize the value of those animals through immune function, uh, regardless of how we wean and how we sell. Um, there, there is a, another question, what are the thoughts or recommendations on nose flaps or quiet wean as weaning methods? So that, that's the two-stage method. Um, so there's a lot of intricacies with the different types of nose flaps. Uh, one is, is uh, the type, one is how they fit inside the nose. Uh, I think the last, uh, last bit is how long they stay in. <laughs> so the idea, for those of you that don't know what the nose flaps are, is uh, they put plastic uh, clips on the inside of the nostrils. And those plastic clips, uh, they're meant as a flap where it impedes their ability to nurse. Uh, so the idea behind that is we are, uh, we're cutting off the nutritional changes from uh, the calves still nursing on mom uh, before we have the abrupt wean or the social wean and the true separation from mom. So essentially we're spreading out those two critical stressors over a period of time. So it's less hindrance on that animal. Um, I've seen it work extremely well. Uh, some producers really have it fine tuned that it, it's, uh, you know, the, the cow kicks the calf off and uh, especially, you know, the calf, cow, had, you know, is completely done with the calf. Uh, by the time we, they do have the physical separation, uh, the calves go about their business and it's no big deal. Uh, I think the fine tuning is figuring out um, how long to keep the nose flaps in, making sure that they're appropriate fits. So we don't get, well, I've seen some pretty, they stay in too long, we can get some really sore noses and see some lesions on the inside of the nostrils. So we wanna make sure that we protect against them. So uh, to protect against that. Uh, from a lot of producers I've heard from, you know, working from five days, maybe up to 10 days that we keep the nose flaps in. Um, so again, it's kind of fine tuning on your individual animals and the individual nose flaps that are, that are being uh, deployed. Um, another question is some producers vac vaccinate with a seven way at birth. Uh, when they ban, will there be an immune response with that method? Um, so they will see some immune response at, even at birth with a killed vaccine like that. Uh, oftentimes at birth, which we have a little bit of a back order and supply issue with it, uh, that we, we can actually use some things called uh, uh, antitoxin. Okay, so we can use t uh, te uh, tetanus antitoxin, which is ready-made antibody. It's not long lasting. Uh, but it can usually give us enough uh, coverage, uh, understanding that we, we can have that maternal antibody interference from the colostrum, uh, where they're not going to respond fully to that vaccine. We can actually bypass the immune system and give them direct antibody through the, those antitoxins uh, to help protect against uh, tetanus. Um, so yes, the seven way can still help. It can absolutely help. Uh, producers that have issues with uh, clostridium perforingens or, or sudden, sudden death issues and purple gut uh, can still give some of those products early in life. Uh, but on, on the general basis, uh, many times there's not a whole lot of product utilization at birth. Uh, but yes, if we are going to be banding at birth, uh, we, we can still get some uh, protection from mom. It's a lower risk uh, for actually developing that disease, but it can happen. I've seen some uh, heifers with navel ill. Uh, that weren't castrated or anything, but still uh, died of tetanus. Uh, so uh, some of those situations, you know, giving giving any antitoxin if we have uh, animals of concern, uh, whether we're banding, whether we're giving the the true seven way or just the antitoxin, you know, we 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 can do some different things to help mitigate those stresses. So uh, yes, uh, that 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 can be implemented. All right. Well, lots of good questions flowing through here. Um, if we have any more while I go over our last slide, you guys can sneak those into the chat one last time to see if you can get an answer from AJ. Um, and at this moment, I will have you stop sharing your screen. I will share my last slide. All right. Just a little bit of information about what we're going to be going over next week. Um, it'll be same time, same day, so 10 a.m. on Thursday. 
Uh, it'll be February 25th, and we'll have Clint Laughlin on with us, and he's going to go over some sire and semen selection. Um, I believe if Brett has a chance, he will pop in the Qualtrics survey. Um, give us just one moment. Um, that'll be in the chat if you guys could fill that out. Um, let us know if you like the program, if you don't like the program, what you want to hear next. Um, that's kind of our key thing to help us um, get to know what you guys want to see in the future and if what we're doing currently is working. So um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Thank you again, AJ, for taking your time today and being on with us. And we hope to see you guys again next week. Scott asked us the question, uh, are we, are there plans for another series? Um, at this point, we have nothing planned, um, but we will continue to plan after we get finished with this one. Um, so at the moment, no, nothing is set in stone, but we are, we will continue to plan and have, uh, have some online programs available. Clint, I think that might be for you. Um, George is asking next week if you'll touch on EPDs on bull buying. Yes, that is part of my presentation for next week, George, and for those of you listening. So uh, be sure to have your questions ready. Uh, I will certainly try to answer any and all as they come up in regards to buying the right bull. Awesome. And again, this uh, program today is going to be recorded takes us a little bit to get that recording. So as soon as we get that downloaded from the cloud or wherever it goes, um, we'll get that to each one of the agents and then they can either send it to you directly or it'll be on our respective websites and YouTube pages. So, all right, well, we will see you guys next week. Thank you.